Welcome, everyone. Uh, we've been broadcasting for 23 hours so far. This is the Oncothon, uh, the first ever marathon uh, to create awareness and raise funds for pediatric cancer drug development, uh, brought by Oncodaily. Um, we are here because we want to, you know, educate the audience and share with the audience, you know, the truth about the pediatric cancer uh, drug development landscape but also because we want to raise funds for, uh, in order to support the launch of the trial um, to test a compound that is called Volacertiv in five different pediatric indications. So my name is Ricardo Garcia. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Oncocleus Bioscience. My son was diagnosed with brain cancer almost 12 years ago. Uh, he's currently a survivor, uh, just uh, accepted uh, to college. Uh, so we celebrate the International Cancer Day at home and with all of you uh, with this event. We're gonna talk about um, the challenges and misconceptions uh, in child cancer drug development. I think this is something we've been discussing the whole day, but today with this session, we have two experts, uh, which I know uh, we've been in discussions many times, we've been partnering and, and it's very exciting. Um, I feel honored uh, to be in this session uh, with the two experts because I feel like, well, I'm definitely the dumb in the room today. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Douglas Hawkins. You know, Doc, uh, Doc is the uh, group chair of the Chile Oncology Group. Uh, he's a professor of pediatrics, uh, hematology oncology at the University of Washington and Seattle uh, Children Hospital. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to the session today. Uh, we have also Peter Adamson, uh, is a global head uh, oncology development and pediatric innov innovation at Sanofi. Um, but many more things, you know, I think maybe, uh, Peter, you can also explain a little bit more about your background and your profile. So today, again, we are talking about um, trying to understand a little bit more the world of child cancer drug development and, and, and the field, uh, you know, by, by, by very unique challenges. Uh, when compared to adult cancer. Um, so, uh, Peter, uh, while I see that Doc disappeared, I'm just delayed for him. Um, again, thank you, Peter, for joining today, uh, the session. Um, I would love to you to uh, provide a little bit more of your profile um, um, because you are now at a, uh, a pharma company, but you've been very, very uh, instrumental and uh, a very important person in the child cancer community. And this is the way I met you, by the way, years ago uh, in Washington. So. Can you just uh, share a little bit more about who are you sure. and why you are so important in the child cancer community? Well, I, first of all, Ricardo, it's wonderful to see you. This is an amazing event. I knew I was going to be towards the end. Um, I didn't realize it's hour 23, and here you are still, uh, still talking, still going strong, and I see so many... Uh, uh, familiar names uh, showing up in the in the stream. So I'm a pediatric oncologist, a clinical pharmacologist. Spent essentially my entire career in academia. Uh, most recently at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and uh, University of Pennsylvania. And I was chairing the Children's Oncology Group. And Doug, uh, uh, when he sorts out technical issues, will be joining. But he followed me. Um, and I was looking for another challenge, and I'd worked with industry and uh, worked with biotech a long time, but I never worked for them. And a remarkable opportunity came along at Sanofi, and I had the opportunity to lead cancer drug development um, for them. And not surprisingly, I also have the opportunity to follow my passion, and that is to see what we can do to improve the outcome for children with cancer, this time seeing what uh, big pharma might be able to do. Well. I'm, I'm very, I'm very looking forward to learn uh, more about, um, you know, your vision uh, from a pharma company into support pediatric cancer research. Doc, you back again? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, what, what would uh, an event be without technical issues? Um, yeah, of uh, course, you know, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, Doc, can you just uh, provide a little bit more information about your background? So uh, I want, I, I hate to introduce uh, the speakers by myself. So I always prefer that someone uh, explains, you know, by his own words, uh, how many times you've been involved and why you are in this role and what you're doing and I mean, what is your responsibility? 
Yeah, so I've I've been involved in pediatric cancer for over 30 years. I uh, have spent my entire professional career at Seattle Children's Hospital in Seattle, Washington, and got involved early in my career in clinical trials uh, related to bone and soft tissue sarcomas. Um, I, my career is intimately associated with the Children's Oncology Group, uh, running studies through there and also as the chair of the Soft Tissue Sarcoma Committee. Um, for, for 11 years before um, assuming the role of group chair from, from Peter. Those were very big shoes to fill, and Peter gave me the job at the most opportune time in the world, March of 2020. Thank you again, Peter, uh, for that opportunity <laughs> to lead through a uh, global disaster. Um, but it's been, it's been tremendously fun, and I, I have always looked at Peter as a role model for someone to, about how to lead an organization and also think critically about how to make progress and improving the outcomes for children with cancer. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining the, the session again. So, um, well, we've been probably the whole day discussing a little bit more about here, here and there about the current landscape of pediatric oncology, though how challenging it is for, uh, for um, companies um, and, and in general, you know, for, for the community to see new drugs um, being gone in, into the pediatric landscape. I think uh, the challenge is by a significant, you know, shortfall of in therapies, uh, specifically said for children, and then we see some scientists and um, um, clinicians forcing to report those existing treatments um, that were initially developed for adult indication, um, and in some cases, as we know, you know, uh, decades ago. So um, I think you know um, we've seen also some kind of progress, and despite of you know. Um, I think we've seen, I mean, Peter, you know, you both of you, you've been here for many years, way before me, I think, um, not because you're, you're too old, all right? It's because I think you have a, a, a quite, you know, understanding about what has been going on. And there's so many efforts we've been uh, doing from, from the child cancer communities. Uh, but despite all the efforts, you know, there's been only seven drugs approved for specifically for pediatric cancer. Um, so, uh, in your opinion, and this is a question for both of you and very open question, so you can go ahead and extend as much as you can. What are the key obstacles of uh, preventing development of more specific pediatric cancer treatments? Um, and how we can try to uh, refine our strategies um, to more effectively meet um, the unique needs of the children, of the children uh, dealing with cancer? I think um, there certainly has been progress, and a lot of that has been driven by uh, the legislative initiatives, both uh, in the U.S. and, and in Europe. Um, for childhood cancer, I think incentives uh, for childhood cancer drug development or all drug development, incentives probably get greater traction than requirements. Um, as far as what has to happen, I, you know, and again, I'm speaking for myself, even though I now work for pharma, um, not, it's not going to be one single part that solves this equation. And I think everyone has to step up. Many are, but I think big pharma also uh, has to step up to the challenge. And I think we really begin early on, that is, the amount of resources going into discovery research for adult cancers far exceeds the amount of resources that go into pediatric discovery research. And that starts at the, um, with, with government funding, uh, private sector funding. Um, you know, the private sector invests an enormous sum of money, but only a limited sum of money in pediatric cancer drug discovery. Um, I then think we have to overcome some of the mythology that e exists around uh, starting studies in, in children with cancer. And one of the myths is that um, it, uh, the risk to a drug development program is too high. And Rick Pazner from the FDA and others have said that uh, there's no example where uh, an adverse event observed in a child has derailed um, mm -hmm. adult drug development. And I think we need to continue to repeat that and tell people that the pediatric cancer community, uh, the children's oncology group that Doug leads, incredible experience with conducting clinical trials um, in children with cancer 
all different types of cancer of all ages, uh, where safety is always paramount. Um, but this the reluctance to get into that space is, is a myth as far as the risk to a, a larger program. The challenge, and then I'll let Doug speak, I think one of the challenges with the incentives is they're not fully aligned with what um, the pediatric community needs. The incentives, the six months of exclusivity extension is very important, but it's realized very late in a product life cycle. And science is moving so quickly, it's hard for industry to know what the true value of that six months is going to be when they're early in, uh, in development. And so there's not a great incentive to start early. And what I th really think we need are incentives for the highest priority drugs, and it doesn't mean every drug, to start early and figuring out how can we craft an incentive that rewards companies to start earlier and so children don't lag as far behind. But Doug? Doug, are you frozen again? Yeah, I think I think I think he's frozen. I think you've been frozen for the whole time, but at least we could hear you. But not. Uh, not can like, you you you're no, muted? You've yeah. muted me. Okay, okay thanks. Okay. Uh, so no, I, I, I'm actually trying to maintain this very intent gaze through my entire. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I can't understand. I, I logged off and logged back on, but I'm it's frozen. Okay. It's okay. Uh, that's okay. Um, so you know, I agree 100 percent with what Peter said. You know, I think our we we have our fundamental problem is numbers. You know, we. Pediatric cancer is rare. 1% of all cancer in the United States occurs in, in people less than 20 years of age. And so when we bring those numbers to the table, we will never appear like a large market. So instead, we have to use a combination of, of cases, um, including uh, leveraging as much as we can the legislative incentives that in provide incentives to pharmaceutical companies for drug development to the extent that requirements that, that um, make it uh, essential that one engages in early pediatric study plan development in order to get an approval for a, a molecularly targeted agent um, uh, in adults. And then also to whatever extent we can make a the moral case, I heard that from the prior speakers about the, the absolute essentialness of doing drug development in pediatrics. We simply can't say it's acceptable that children have to wait on average on median time of six and a half years from when the first in human study happens to the first in kid studies happen. That's that's too long to wait for children who have advanced cancer. Um, but I think we can also point to some of our our success stories. If you look back over the last several years, just just within the COG experience, um, sixteen drugs were approved by the FDA using data from our studies, from COG studies. Mm -hmm. And I think what that says is there is an infrastructure with sufficient rigor of data collection and reliability that we can use data from our studies within our network to get drugs approved. We just need to add to that list. And I think, you know, Peter's thought about identifying the highest priority drugs. Not, not every drug that's being developed for an adult indication is relevant in pediatrics, but fortunately a number of them are and how we can leverage this combination of incentives, regulatory requirements, and the moral imperative to do drug development in pediatrics to use the infrastructure that already exists to get these approvals. Be before we, uh, I have I have another question that I want to ask you, but Doc, just to clarify a little bit more, uh, uh, maybe to, to uh, again, I think just to educate um, the audience, at least some of the people that is attending, uh, because that's something that I learned by myself, um, so w when we think about clinical trials, you know, enrolling and, and participation rate in clinical trials, you know, uh, there, there is a, I think there is a misconception that, you know, well, because there are so few kids, it's going to be very complicated. I mean, it's not only what you said before, Peter, it's like the myth of, well, well, what if something's going wrong? And also, um, I had this conversation with many investors, by the way, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. you know, venture capitalists, a lot of investors, which uh, to my surprise, they didn't know anything about the pediatric cancer landscape. So, uh, and then we have to educate them and we have to explain them what well, that's not true. This is all like it is. Um, but one of the things that is very recurrent in those conversations is like, well, the participation rates. Uh, and Doug, I think you can try to clarify a little bit more about, um, about this topic. Yeah, so one of the advantages that we have in pediatric oncology is the 
the cohesive nature in which treatment is provided and the unified approach of institutions working together. That, I mean, that's in stark contrast to what happens in, in adults with cancer, where most care is provided at community settings and there's a very low participation rate in clinical trials. I mean, what's been estimated is less than 5% of adults participate in treatment clinical trials uh, in the front line. Within, C, within the United States, that is closer to 20%. Um, participate in frontline COG clinical trials. That's in the era of 2004 to 2015. It's even higher for certain diseases like acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where that it approaches 60% of children in the United States participate in a frontline COG study. And the reason that happens, I think, is because there's a tradition within pediatric oncology of collaboration of institutions, hundreds of institutions across a country as big as the United States working together for a common cause, uh, not competing with each other, but working together. And that's led to these very high participation rates in clinical trials. So even though pediatric cancer is relatively rare, because we have this unified network of institutions working together, we can attack even rare pediatric cancers because we, we, we're able to enroll patients at a relatively high rate, certainly much higher than, than seen in adults. Yep. Um, thank you, Doc. Um, I think that really provide a lot of additional information of, 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 of that question mark that I've heard continuously. Uh, Peter, um, you are working on the pharma industry right now in a company. Um, and I have to be honest, uh, you know, for many times, uh, I was still, I'm still, you know, um, explaining everyone and when everyone is asking for why, you know, there are no more drugs uh, uh, approved for pediatric cancer, you know, why is one of the reasons, okay, well, this is a rare disease. Uh, and, and that you know that makes it not a very profitable market for organizations like the pharma companies and other biotech. So, uh, but you said something at the very beginning, which I think is the truth. So we need to work together. So there is no way we can solve these problems unless we all sit down. Uh, regulators, uh, pharma companies, biotech uh, parents, association, foundations, researchers, and we finally went together to um, sort it out and, and, and fix this problem. So, um, if that's possible, um, and I'm not sure, but how do you think large companies like Sanofi uh, navigate challenges uh, of pediatric drug development? Is there, is there any any um, um, ideas that you are guys thinking about it? Is there any way that you think could contribute uh, to support the child cancer community and identify those opportunities for children that are dealing with uh, uh, devastating diseases? Yeah, and so I'll speak in general, and then I'll, I'll I'll get specific. And so it's been a steep learning curve for me uh, coming to industry, but it's also been a fascinating uh, learning curve. Um, one of the challenges, or some of the challenges, revolve around um, gaps in our knowledge. Um, when a drug is brought into the clinic for adult cancers, it's backed up by a remarkable amount of data about the knowledge of the target, about what the, the drug does in preclinical models. Um, by the time pediatric work starts, you're already at least two to three years behind. And so finding a way to generate the knowledge so a company can look at their pipeline and say, all right, which of our drugs might be particularly relevant for childhood cancer. What do we need to do to close that gap in knowledge? And that can be done collaboratively and should be done collaboratively. Um, in Europe, we have the ITCC uh, P4 preclinical, preclinical consortium, similar consortiums in, in the US. Uh, we need to close the gaps in knowledge of the drugs that we're developing for certain targets in adults and find out what their relevance, uh, relevance is to pediatric cancers. And then um, one thing to, to my good surprise, about a year after I joined, and I think this is true at other companies, um, we have a corporate social responsibility uh, program. And uh, the idea is we're a global company, we should do things for the global good. Um, and some of the programs that were uh, and are still ongoing from Sanofi included uh, eliminating polio because Sanofi is a big vaccine division for polio, eliminating uh, sleeping sickness, a disease in low income countries. And the third one that we have now is, is childhood cancer. And the idea is 
the business model doesn't need to come first, but can we leverage an R and D engine to do good, to do global good? And we're early in that program. We've started, and you know, the first goal is to close gaps in knowledge that we have about targets. Then working with external experts and collaborators, saying, "Okay, we think this is potentially." very relevant to children with cancer. What more information do we need? Getting that information and then actually not waiting for requirements and not waiting for incentives, but just starting. And both the EU and EMA and uh, FDA have said, you can get started without having a pediatric plan in place. You can get started without having a, a PIP in place. You still need to do those. Um, but since those processes can take long, you can get started with drug development. And so our first goal is to greatly shorten that six and a half year gap that Doug spoke about um, between first in adult cancers and first in children with cancer and get started on the highest priority drugs. Uh, the vision and the crazy vision, Ricardo, is you know, if we can demonstrate that a component of our budget can be dedicated to children with cancer, and we still can be a big pharma company. I think other companies might follow. Mm -hmm. um, it's one piece of the puzzle. There's remarkable resources. And by that, I don't mean money or just money. I mean, um, there's talent within pharma about how to develop a drug from medicinal chemistry to global, uh, global requirements to um, uh, how to turn clinical trials um, into approved medications and get the drugs out to, out to the people that need them. Um, so I, I'm optimistic. I know we have a long way to go. Um, I think overall incentives are probably um, what will move the needle the furthest and come yep. up with creative incentives and then business models. Um, and there have been a few successes, but you know better than, than anyone um, coming up with a business model that's sustainable uh -huh. for rare diseases is a challenge, but it's a challenge that I think ultimately we can meet. Yeah, and I do agree with what you said. So, well, it is a challenge, uh, but it's not impossible. So, it, the fact that nobody did it before, it doesn't mean that it's not possible to build it. Um, this is kind of more or less what we're trying to prove uh, by dedicating resources and effort into building a company only focused on pediatric cancer. So uh, pediatric cancer is, uh, it is true, is a, a very small market compared with adult uh, uh, cancer, but you know, there's no one there. Uh, so, and I hate to, to say that, you know, I had to think about, you know, that we need to think about becoming profitable and, and build a sustainable company, but this is the only way definitely uh, to move forward. And, and I think it is, it is okay if we think about building in, in a company that needs to be, of course, profitable and sustainable. So. Yeah, um, there's a lot of word ahead there. So uh, we're very excited. I'm looking forward to see how uh, Sanofi uh, is evolving into this uh, new adventure, um, exploring you know, opportunities to support the child cancer community. At least, you know, it's in the starting point. Um, and if you ever need some kind of support uh, to advocate, just um, call us. <laughs> All right, so um, Doc, um, question to you. Um, well, we're almost done. Um, how you uh, prioritize uh, at the Children Oncology Group uh, drugs, which drugs of treatment, you know, should be pushed forward in clinical trials, you know, especially considering, you know, the unique needs of the patients. Um, what is the criteria? Try to understand, you know, how the organization works and select, you know, and, and, and recommend which, which one should be, you know, uh, should require more effort than others. Well, I hope I'm, again, maintaining my very intense gaze of my frozen <laughs> photo there. Um, I think there's several criteria. The first, it starts with the science. You know, we, we to the extent that we have the preclinical data, and Peter already alluded to the, the delay in getting the preclinical package in a, in a pediatric model, but, uh, but it's very important that we have pre, strong preclinical data that says this target is relevant in a pediatric cancer, the 
um, in models that we have that are that are pediatric models, not carcinoma models, but pediatric models that this is a um, that this drug has uh, uh, could be effective in in some pediatric uh, cancer models. That that's probably the key thing. We don't want to investigate every drug that's being developed in adults. We want to develop the ones that are relevant to a target that we know is is important in driving pediatric cancer and uh, preclinical data to support um, its. Um, suggestion of activities such that we would be willing to move into human uh, pediatric trials. Um, but then what do we, how do we prioritize? Well, you know, I think there's different types of unmet need. Um, there's the diseases for which we have a, uh, a really an unacceptably low outcome. And we can name what those are, metastatic sarcomas, certain types of brain tumors, where we have not improved survival um, despite 30, 40 years of clinical trials. Those are areas where we really need to come up with new strategies, new new drugs. But I, I don't want to lose sight of the other unmet need, which is the um, for diseases for which we have good early survival rates, meaning five-year survival rates, but we have a burden of late effects that's really unacceptable. And that, you know, we have many diseases that fall in that category, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, Hodgkin lymphoma, where the early survival rate looks very good, but if you look at the burden of long-term side effects, it's unacceptable 10 or 20 years down the road. So when we think about um, drugs to develop, we need to keep our eyes both on drugs that could improve survival, um, but also could we develop a more, a less toxic way of treating patients such that the burden of, of, of uh, late effects, the cost of cure is lower. And so I think we, we consider both of those and considering the priorities of how we develop uh, clinical trials and the drugs to incorporate in. Yeah. Well, thank you so much um, for um, explaining to us a little bit more about your criteria, how you prioritize uh, the trials. Um, we were done, I think we just, uh, I would spend much more time with you guys. Um, I think, again, it's been a pleasure and an honor uh, having you here. So um, I just want to remind everyone that we are uh, doing this event because we want to raise awareness um, and also raise funds for supporting the opening of a trial uh, of our uh, lead compound philosophy that is going to be tested in the clinic for five different pediatric indications. So uh, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining uh, the session with Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Doc. Uh, looking forward to meet you in another event and another place um, and to continue the conversation. Thank you for so much for your efforts. Thank you. And um, we're optimists. That's why we're here. Yeah. So thank, thank you to all the children and families for the inspiration. And thank you, Ricardo, and to all the advocates for telling us to push harder. Thank you so we much. We can do it. Thank you.